good morning. I'm Catherine Poolman. It's really nice to see all of you. And I want to do a couple of things this morning. I want to talk through what the frameworks look like from the perspective of how we can think about these issues in a very practical way. What can we actually do to advance trade and development? And I would say that trade and development, so my organization is called the New Markets Lab. We are focused on legal and regulatory reform. I've also done trade my entire career. I was a trade negotiator at USTR with Andrea. I worked as a trade lawyer. And for about the last 10 years, please don't do the math, I have focused on trade and development a bit more. I've done it through the nonprofit sector. I've worked at several think tanks. And then ultimately I decided to start an organization because there were gaps that I saw that I thought that perhaps we could try to work to address. So we're working now in about 15 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We work in India, we work in China. I spend a lot of my time in the field. Um, but what I think this does is gives me an ability to look across different practices. I see very good practices, by the way, coming from all countries we work in. It's not just something that's coming from a few countries and, and being pushed out. There are really good practices all over, and I think a lot of innovation in trade. But I do think that these issues impact every economy. I think they impact the United States, too. I think every country is trying to figure out how to use trade to open up new opportunity. And I think that's what part of what development is about. I think it's about opening up opportunity that's not already being realized. And I think it's also doing it in a way that's more inclusive, that will bring as many people as possible into the trading system. So when I was at USTR, this was a question that we were thinking quite a bit about, um, particularly when I think the whole <coughs> dialogue on trade started shifting uh, with the Seattle ministerial and, and Doha and some of the things that Andrea talked about. But, but I can't help but to try to be very practical in how I apply these things. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about policy, but I'll also talk a little bit about how we could use policy in different and, and perhaps some innovative ways. And I hope you all have some ideas too, because I think that's one of the great things about this particular session, that there's always so much good stuff that comes out. So I'll try to go through these a little bit quickly, if that's okay, and then happy to answer questions. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Good, okay. So here are some of the, just the framework issues. I think one, of course, trade and development has an impact at the multilateral level, at the WTO. And I'll talk in just a second about where that tends to come up. Some of the legal standards are not the hardest legal standards, but I think that what has started to happen with trade and development is, is that it's become very embedded in the system, which means that there are so many different ways to, to work on trade development at the WTO level, even if there is not necessarily a completely binding legal standard to do it. Um, then Andrea mentioned regional trade. So since we do so much work in, in so many other parts of the world, regional trade is of course a tremendous issue. And it's been fascinating to me to see all of the work that we've done on, I would say trade issues, but at a very national level too within a lot of countries. And to see how that national level intersects with the regional trade agreements. How do you take a regional trade agreement to make it come to life essentially, which has to happen at the country level, no matter where you are. If the countries are the ones that have to implement regional trade agreements. It doesn't happen magically just by having the trade agreement itself. Um, and then within that, I you know, I think that <coughs> within every trade agreement, right, we have kind of the market access type side of things, which I think is important when we're thinking about opening up new opportunities. But I would say that I think the rules side of it is even more important in some ways because those are the things that are going to impact what can happen in the market. Um, and I do think that we maybe could shift how we look at trade agreements a little bit more towards the rules side rather than market access being kind of the lead that we go into. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Then we have kind of the traditional trade development tool, at least coming from you know, a, a lot of the, the United States, Canada, some of the more developed markets, the trade preference program. I mean, I think that's dominated the discussion on trade and development for probably the last 40 plus years. For us, for the United States, this is the Generalized System of Preferences Program. A lot of other countries have GSP programs as well. And then the more specific programs like the African Growth and Opportunity Act, the program for Haiti, the program for the Caribbean. I, don't, I think these are good tools, but I don't think that they do everything that they need to do to really impact trade development. They're not designed that way. So I don't think that there's a reason to not think about them in the context of, of this, but I think we need to think a little bit more broadly than, than just the program. Programs. Um, then there's aid for trade, and Andrea spoke about that a bit. I'll just touch upon it, but it of course oops, cuts across all of these things. Um, 
investment issues, Andrea mentioned the bilateral investment treaties. I think those are part of this too. I don't. I think the bilateral investment treaties, again, are one tool in thinking about this, but they won't cover everything when we think about how to incorporate development on the investment side. So perhaps we need some creative approaches there too. And then a lot, I spend a lot of my time actually working at the sector level or looking at particular value chains and how you try to get them to open up, bringing in these trade disciplines, but thinking from much more of kind of a market perspective. Uh, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs and trying to help them think through some of the challenges that they're having in the market. So for me, some of this is particularly compelling because it seems very real. And it's not just kind of a, a broad legal framework, it's actually what, you know, trying to solve, work through these particular challenges that come up. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but I, you know, there we're talking about non-tariff issues of all kinds, which are of course becoming much more the topic of conversation as tariffs become less and less where we're focusing our energy. We've done so much already to try to reduce tariffs, but I think non-tariff issues are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, that could be sector-specific regulation, it could be food safety standards, <coughs> it could be product standards. Services, Andrea mentioned, are a huge part of any country's trade. Um, and I'm glad to see that they're getting more integrated into the trade development debate, but I think that needs to happen even more so. And services, of course, it's a broad range of things. Financial services, ICT, distribution services, transport. And most of those are force multipliers for reform throughout the economy. So if you can figure out how to get those services sectors to open up, you wind up seeing reverberations throughout an economy that impact every sector. Um, other things that impact the enabling environment for business, intellectual property, of course, labor, environment, um, and then I think things like land and energy, too, which are really outside of business, <coughs> but of course have an impact on, on every type of business activity, every new opportunity that's going to happen in the market. So this is just a really quick summary of special and differential treatment. It, it's quick also because, like I said before, the legal standard is not particularly binding. So just really quickly, if you, you know, want to know where this comes up, there's something called part four of the GATT, which was really the first place the special and differential treatment kind of came um, into play. And the thing that you should remember about that, I mean, most of this you can see is kind of aspirational language. Develop, developing countries want to have special focus on the products that are important to them, that developed countries should take exercise restraints in their own policies. But the last bit on reciprocity not required is really the piece that's come to be um, how we think about special and differential treatment. That developing countries, and particularly least developed countries, shouldn't have to do everything that developed countries have to do in a trade negotiation, or shouldn't have to do it all as quickly. And that has implications for the negotiators. It also has implications, though, for the entrepreneurs or for the businesses that are working in those countries, because I think in some cases, having some of the standards in place is going to help generate new business opportunities. So I think there's a little bit of a tension there on the development side. The trade preference programs have really been a mainstay, I think, since the, the middle of the last century. The legal authority for those is under the enabling clause, which also enshrines this, this principle of non-reciprocity and gives the legal authority for trade agreements between developing countries. Um, so it's another important piece to remember when you think about just, I can't help myself, I'm a lawyer, so I always think about where, what is the rule and what do you have to go back to, but then within that, how can you use that in different way trade agreements. I, I would say too, there's flexibility within the agreements themselves, because they're tend to, at the WTO level, they tend to be somewhat generally written. So for a country to think through how to apply some of those things, there is actually a fair degree of latitude. I don't think that every country necessarily always knows how to do that in every single sector. I think that's probably true across the board, but there is latitude, and there has also been some flexibility um, through these extensions and, and you know, phase-ins of the agreements. There's a committee on trade developments, LDC committee. There's a new thing called the LDC services waiver, which says that developed countries should give preference to services from these developed countries, and a number of countries have notified commitments under that. Um, and then there's the trade facilitation agreement, which Andrea mentioned, which I think is worth noting in a couple of respects. So first of all, under the Doha round, everything was supposed to move together as a package, and that didn't happen for various reasons. Trade facilitation had been an issue on the table for quite a long time, and then it kind of healed off to do a separate agreement um, 
that, that did get um, pushed forward and is now awaiting, it's, so it hasn't gone into effect yet because it's awaiting ratification by two thirds of the memberships, but I think we're getting quite close. Last time I looked at the numbers, we're really close. So quite soon, this will go into full effect. And I think that the understanding was that this helps everybody. If you can streamline what happens at the border when you're trying to move things from one place to another, it will help everybody. And certainly, you know, with trade becoming so, um, you know, so quickly moving across borders, with supply chains so quickly moving across borders, this really does make a big difference. And a lot of the places I work, you know, the, the time that it takes to transport something is one of the big factors in cost. It's one of the big factors in, you know, whether companies choose to invest. So this, I think, has, has a huge impact. It covers a number of different things. Transparency, which I think is also an important element of trade and development, just knowing what the rules are and when they're going to change. I found out this week about a rule in Kenya that had changed that impacts me as a small business because we were thinking about opening an office in East Africa, and all of a sudden the Companies Act has changed in Kenya. And I'm not sure that it was fully discussed and vetted. And, you know, it's sort of terrifying, even as a lawyer, when you know that the rules could change arbitrarily and you're not sure what that means for you. So as a, any kind of, I think, business operating in any environment, you want to have some degree of transparency and ability to interact with the legal system as it's being developed. Um, there's a lot of very technical stuff on just moving things, releasing them, expediting, sometimes handling for, for um, agricultural products, for example, that will perish. Um, border agency cooperation, how uh, countries work with each other on trying to facilitate movement. And then, I think one of the other things that's so interesting about the Trade Facilitation Agreement is it's actually a really good model on capacity building. Andrea mentioned this. It's sort of, I think it's an innovation in how we think about agreements. So it, it basically gives countries the ability to decide what's most important to them, what they can do on their own, what they think they need assistance with, and how they want to phase some of those transitions. So there are three different categories under the Trade Facilitation Agreement that relate to, to putting those commitments into place. And that could be an interesting model that we look at for other things too. You know, it's not going to be the same for everybody. It has to be customized. And so within a trade agreement, of course, then a lot of the same issues will come up that will come up at the multilateral level, rules of origin, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, technical barriers to trade, product standards, of course, trade facilitation, investment, intellectual property. Labor tends to be more prominent in, the, in, in bilateral regional trade agreements than at the multilateral levels. It's not really an issue that's dealt with at the WTO, although the ILO um, deals with labor at the international level. Environment tends to, again, be an issue that's more enshrined to regional agreements. And then this issue of regulatory coherence, TBT is just an example, but how do you, again, harmonize standards between countries? Uh, which we've had a lot of experience doing kind of at the, at the implementation level, which has been sort of fascinating in how I think about now these, these agreements. Um, and Andrea mentioned the, the capacity building already. So I work with a lot of students, as you probably saw from my, um, my first slide. I teach law school at, at, at two different schools, and one of the things that I did with some of my students at Harvard last year was to have them look through as many trade agreements as we could cram into the year and come out with some good practices on development, both explicit and implicit. So these are some of the things that we came up with. One is that there now seems to be a bit more of a trend to thinking about the issues that are included in trade agreements from the perspective of how you build a diverse and well-functioning and inclusive economy. So I call this the building block approach. Um, the United States has an agreement that's relatively new with the East African community called the Cooperation Agreement among the partner states of the EAC um, and the U.S. on trade facilitation, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and tech technical barriers to trade, which is kind of a mouthful. But I think Cooperation Agreement is the short version of that. And this is, I think, something that, again, could be an interesting model. Um, the U.S. CAFTA um, DRFTA, I think, has some elements of this kind of building block approach as well. And some of the European agreements have this concept embedded in them as well. The staging of commitments that we saw at the multilateral level through special and differential treatment, you can also see that in, in regional and bilateral trade agreements. Um, how do you tailor this to the particular circumstances of a country? 
which makes sense if we're thinking if development is, is meant to encourage new growth in the market. We have, it has to be more tailored. Every market is going to be different. Every sector is going to be different. Um, the U.S.-Morocco FTA, which was being negotiated when I was at USTR, I wasn't one of the negotiators on it, but my office was working on it. And one of the things that struck me then, too, that was so interesting about that, was that the U.S.-Morocco FTA had a bit of a staged approach on agriculture, which was a sector that was really important to Morocco. <coughs> and the government, my recollection was, said, you know, we don't know exactly how the sector is going to develop, but we want to be able to use the agreement to encourage that development, rather than locking in something where we're not quite sure where things are going to go. So I think that's another interesting concept to think about as well, focusing on specific economic sectors and maybe bringing in some of these things that are part of trade but are not always formally included, like energy. It's impossible to do anything without reliable access to energy. So how could that kind of be linked more into trade agreements? And Europe, I think, has done a better job than the United States, at least, in, in kind of making that connection in trade agreements. So that might be something else that we could do through trade agreements across the board. Um, and then encouraging private sector engagement and consultation. I think this is really important too, because I think we sometimes have this idea that trade policy gets done by governments, and it does. But governments are not acting on their own, and governments are usually not driving the entire market. Um, so you have to have some private sector engagement in the process. They're the ones who are going to be using the system. And I would say that has to be private sector from a you know, very wide perspective. Small companies as well. The ones who don't necessarily always know how to um, access some of these things. So, so we see that in some of our FTAs as well. Um, I think that concept. In the TPP, there are some interesting things on development. Women, SMEs, there's a particular development chapter. You know, I think some of the sector specific comes up. The anti-corruption, now some will say that these standards are not hard enough, and it's probably true that they could be made even more binding. But the fact that it's in there, I think, means something. Um, here's the trade preference programs. We talked about those already, so I think you probably know those as tools. They're just a duty preference going into a developed market. And they don't really get at a lot of these issues of how do you get the economy to function well. They maybe reference them through some of the conditionality, but they don't really give you the ability to work through some of those rules-based issues. Trade is designed around that, but I would say that aid alone probably can't fully develop um, the market either, that it has to be, again, this interaction between the private sector and government and really kind of working through specific issues. But of course, aid for trade has done a lot of you know, really good things to try to address these different aspects of capacity, technical assistance, infrastructure, productive capacity, um, how to adjust when things change. And we've got a lot of examples in the U.S. programs, and of course many countries have, you know, very robust aid for trade programs. So I'm just going to quickly give you a couple of thoughts on what we might think about going forward. One is, I don't even know if that's what I said, but I think one is, where do we go from here? Is there a different way to think about trade agreements, trade policy, that perhaps could be a little bit more ground up rather than just completely top down? And I think that a value chain approach to me anyway is sort of a logical way of thinking about that because you really have to go through all of the steps to making the market work. Here's a very simplified value chain, generalized for agriculture. But you put really, you know, you start with sort of the base, the production level, where you have a lot of small farmers working, where you have a lot of women working, and think through the issues there, which does get into some of the things that I mentioned, like land, like inputs that Andrea mentioned. We do a lot of work on the regulatory structures around inputs because they're very, very complicated. And I should have brought another slide to show you, which is just one part of a process in one country of how to register a new seed, which has like 18 steps and some of them repeat, it's like a board game almost where you have to go back to go, and you have to go back through the process, and the whole thing can take several years. Sometimes it's uncertain how long it will actually take. I've seen a lot of countries that make improvements to that system, and one of the things that we're working on right now is whether we can digitize some of these assessments that we've done, these flow charts that we've done, so that maybe there can be an opportunity to both reflect in real time when something changes, and also give people an opportunity to comment on the system, because as I was saying before, the transparency, the interaction, is I think a critical part of making this work. Laws are just, they're on paper. And 
making them work in practice requires people. It requires regulators making decisions, and it requires businesses, entrepreneurs, individuals doing things to, to try to test out the system. So as you go along the value chain, then you deal with a lot of the logistics issues and storage, what happens if you move the production someplace where it can be effectively stored. This, of course, breaks down in a lot of places. And all of it relates back to the trade rules again. But this is very specific in, to domestic legislation, too. What kind of rules do countries have in place to allow for this? And how do those domestic rules interact with some of those higher level frameworks? What happens when you deal with processing? And, and how, do you, how do you make sure that standards are embedded into the um, economic structure and the legal structure of a country so that when you go to the processing stage, you can capture some of the value in the country? And then how do you get to a market? Um, which isn't the first thing you think about when you're developing a value chain. You have to know where the market is, but, but the market is not the, it's not the starting point. It's, it's kind of where you come out on the other end. And then some of these cross-cutting issues that I mentioned. And then I'm just going to end with this, which is a, not a very good map of corridors, but it's, it's a map of something physical. I think that part of trade is physical markets. And this is a map of where some of the hard infrastructure was initially built in Africa to essentially move some of the commodities out without doing a lot of value addition and a lot of processing. But it's interesting because it's, it's this, I think, underpins where some of the trade routes are developing more and more. And if you can take this kind of physical idea of where the markets are and build the rules and the systems around it, you can start to see an opportunity for encouraging growth in some of the sectors that we talked about. So, Leave it at that. I hope this was helpful. I'm sorry it was so fast, but I hope you have a lot of questions.